Okay, great. Hello and welcome everyone to our monthly WFO webinar. My name is uh, Ilya Karnauhov and I'm the development manager at the World Forum of Show Wind. Today's webinar is on offshore wind technology updates. And it's my great pleasure to welcome our two excellent speakers for today. We have Mark Upston, a senior director at Bentley Systems, and we have Callum Maxwell, a regional partnership manager at Catapult. And before we jump into their presentations, let me say you a, a few things about WFO. Um, the organization was founded in 2018, and we're a nonprofit entity focused on offshore wind energy only, promoting offshore wind energy worldwide, and our members represent the complete offshore wind uh, value chain. We have an international uh, set up offices in Hamburg, Tokyo, Taipei, in New York. In terms of WFO activities, it's very straightforward as we focus on three things. We lobby for offshore wind around the world. We inform about offshore wind via, via various media channels, and we connect the global offshore wind community by doing events. Uh, and in terms of our members, uh, as you can see on this slide, we're very happy to have a very broad range of global members from around the world, which you can see. We're delighted to have companies uh, from uh, various segments of our value chain from North America, Europe, Asia, and even Australia. If you're not a member of WFO yet, please join us and uh, contact our manager director, Gunnar Hersik, if you have any questions um, or if you would like to uh, receive an application to join the WFO. Um, so, and also do not hesitate to reach us if you have any questions. So, uh, slightly about the presentation structure, say, uh, let me say a few things. Uh, it's actually very simple. During the first roughly 30 minutes, uh, Callum and Mark will present on the topic. And during the second part of the webinar, or also about uh, 30 minutes, we'll have a Q&A session. And each of you, of the attendees, can ask a question using the chat function on your control panel on the right hand side. So that's, um, that's from my side. And uh, without any further ado, Mark, the floor is yours. Okay. Can you can, can you see my screen? Yes. Ilya? Right. Yes. Thanks. So uh, welcome everyone. My name is Mark Upston, uh, Senior Director, as Ilya said, of Product Management at Bentley Systems here. Um, today I'm going to talk about um, uh, the efficiency gains that you can get from a digital twin. Um, and it's changing the conversation of how to better execute and save cost on offshore wind projects. Uh, for those that don't know what a digital twin is, uh, Bentley's representation of a digital twin is a physical asset process or system. And so why is this all happening today? Um, well, infrastructure digital twins have become possible due to the convergence of IoT, um, 3D and 4D visualization, reality modeling, uh, mixed reality, and digital engineering is actually enabling an immersive and holistic view of infrastructure assets. So let me go to the next slide here. Uh, just a little bit of a little bit of information about Bentley um, Systems. Um, they're based in uh, Exton, Pennsylvania in the US, and it has been around for, since the 1980s, uh, and well known for its MicroStation 2D and 3D uh, CAD system, which is <coughs> was running on uh, PDS. Today is a broad portfolio of engineering software products for information modeling uh, by way of integrated projects uh, to support an intelligent infrastructure on a digital twin platform. And we call that digital twin platform an iTwin. Uh, we've been a leader in offshore uh, software design engineering for the last 40 years, as well as leading positions in infrastructure, in structural, road and rail, uh, bridges, process plan operations, construction, uh, infrastructure asset operations, <coughs> and project work sharing. 
So a comprehensive digital twin solution for offshore wind turbine platforms um, can reduce levelized cost of energy in three key life cycle areas. The first is it can provide efficient planning, design, and more cost-effective fixed and floating foundations, uh, as well as looking at uh, the capacity and design of transmission grids and substations. Um, on the construction side, it can reduce the risk and deliver on, on schedule projects. And all the way through to operations and maintenance, uh, the cost can be reduced through remote monitoring, inspection, and predictive maintenance services. So the digital twin not only increases the level of confidence in your decision-making process, but it helps break down silos of data and increasing collaboration and a clear line of sight across the entire enterprise for any offshore wind project. And you may have seen some of the digital twins uh, popping up in various places and various companies um, like uh, Fugro, Rambol, Acre Solutions, and even GE have their own turbine digital twin now. A digital twin can significantly reduce both CapEx and OpEx cost, as shown by McKinsey 2019 report, based on user projects that have leveraged the digital twin. You can see on the left, uh, CapEx savings in design time, rework, procurement, and on the right-hand side, you can see on the OPEX side, savings in reduced maintenance and fewer outages. A digital twin can handle many different types of data, including drawings, specifications, documents, design and analytical models, uh, even photos, reality meshes, laser scans, um, of course, IoT feeds, and enterprise resource and asset management data. And users are able to track and uh, changes and visualize, including changes in real world conditions from those IoT connected devices such as sensors and drones, and, and able to make better informed decisions. And with that, anticipate and avoid issues before they arise. They can react more quickly with confidence, and hence there's a resulting cost savings, improved service avail availability, and safety and lower environmental impact. Simply put, a digital twin enables the supply chain to execute better in a collaborative, low-risk virtual environment. And a digital twin for the offshore wind industry should span the entire asset life cycle. So uh, Bentley actually has a broad suite of applications from planning through to design, construction, and operations and maintenance, all working from a single source of truth. And across those three areas of the life cycle, firstly in design and, and engineering, the big benefit is building improving engineering options quicker and develop a more optimized solution. On the construction side is actually reducing the time to start up and less risk and less rework. In operations and maintenance, you can optimize the maintenance uh, and availability plans, minimize those unnecessary offshore visits, and ensure visibility across all the silos of data I mentioned earlier to make those rapid, more safe decision-making make, decisions there. Uh, Bentley's uh, uh, iTwin platform is actually open source, built on JavaScript. It includes API tools to customize workflows that you see here for sharing, synchronizing data, incorporating LiDAR or 3D reality meshes. 3D visualization and taking advantage of the IoT sensors I mentioned, AI, uh, as well as augmented reality. And in fact, uh, one recent project we have <coughs> using the iTwin platform, we're able to reduce their hours by 30% using these tools. And there's a broad range of both Bentley and third-party applications. Uh, and data exchange formats that uh, many of you will probably recognize here. So when it comes to planning, uh, the important part is getting all the stakeholders on the same page. So as an offshore wind planner, they typically want to combine the meta ocean data with the water depth profiles, the seabed conditions, and various turbine equip equipment options. So the different wind farm layouts can quickly evaluate suitable foundation sizes and project costs. Uh, Bentley's partner, 
future on has actually been working on a large, with a large number of developers on such projects. And recently Bentley acquired um, the Sequent Leapfrog um, product range, which is a leading solution for 3D digital ground information modeling that you can see in the bottom left-hand corner here, which is very important for siting offshore wind farms in a stable seabed soil conditions. And when it, when it comes to offshore power transmission, uh, open utilities is available to optimize grid and cable layouts in a single web system. So you can uh, look at the capacity planning for the grid uh, power simulation. A project manager can review project data for onshore or offshore substations and compare the layout optimization system. And you can also view Brownfield substation information as well and share that across the whole enterprise. So when it comes to design phase, uh, for the last 10 years, Bentley has actually had a, a product called Open Wind Power Fix Foundation <clears throat> used to analyze and design jackets, minor piles, and recently suction buckets to support offshore wind turbines from different turbine manufacturers around the world. And more recently, at the end of 2020, we introduced a, a product called Open Wind Power Floating Platform. And this is a single user interface product with an end-to-end -end design workflow for a floating platform. It actually combines the aeroelastic behavior of the turbine with the hydrostatic motion and structural performance of the platform itself. And one such company, Keystone Engineering, was uh, the first, um, they executed on the first uh, project in the US, in fact, a 30 megawatt offshore wooden project at Block Island. And they relied on parametric modeling, high performance and cloud computing to and design optimization. They were actually able to adapt a deep water structure that you see here from the oil industry to significantly reduce the amount of steel required. And they result, this resulted in a 20% installed cost saving and 50% reduced design hours uh, compared to typical European offshore wind projects. And here's another project um, executed out of China in the Three Gorges region, and they were able to achieve a 70% efficiency gain and save a combined 700 man days on the project, including 300 days uh, saved using the parametric modeling we just mentioned earlier. Uh, Open Wind Power, in fact, uh, it integrates with ITWIN for design review, collaboration, uh, issue resolution, clash detection, and synchronizing design changes on the cloud during both conceptual and detailed design engineering. And the engineering team can actually invite any contractor, equipment supplier, or stakeholder to meet together and, and make better and manage better design decisions. So let's take a look at construction. Um, we know that wind farm monopiles are getting larger and larger to support larger 12 megawatt, 40 megawatt, and recently 16 megawatt uh, Ming Yang turbine from China. So new, advanced, more cost-effective foundation design approaches are now required to safely operate these large turbines. And one recent case study uh, we, we have out of China as well, where the foundation and substructure cost, uh, which actually represents about 15 to 20% of the CapEx cost, they were able to reduce their foundation design and installation cost by 30% using uh, integrated suction bucket design workflow. And a digital twin in the construction phase can actually add value from 40 construction time simulation uh, AR, as I mentioned, or augmented reality for resource management and optimized scheduling. And using a iTwin-based solution on an offshore wharf project, they, they used 4D scheduling. They were able to achieve enhanced visualization to accelerate the construction, minimize risk, and reduce the non-conformances on the project. So lastly, how can a digital twin benefit operations and maintenance for the, uh, the owner operator? A recent partnership between Microsoft, Doosan Heavy Industries and Bentley in South Korea 
a 3D reality model was generated for the offshore wind project that you can see here. And off the coast, the live power from any of the turbines can be viewed from IoT sensors linked together. Both the observed power and design power can be seen together in real time or across any time period. And power performance in any component alert warnings can be displayed. And using AI and the weather forecast data, they can predict the uh, power production in the future. And the power of high definition 3D reality models can actually um, combine with uh, machine learning AI, identify surface corrosion, fatigue cracking, or any damage uh, to both the tower foundation or the turbine itself, reducing expensive manual inspections. And combining digital twin, eye twin with the Internet of Things, remote sensor data can actually track turbine blade erosion, performance, gearbox vibration, or even platform corrosion, like I mentioned, foundation movement. And this provides real-time data and historical reporting to maintain and operate the assets more effectively. And one such um, uh, case study actually was with uh, Worley Digital working with a major UK offshore wind developer. Uh, we're able to achieve 80% reduction in offshore inspection visits uh, on the transmission assets uh, using a reliability centered maintenance program. An operational cost can run up to 40% of the total cost over the life of the wind farm using structural and mechanical integrity management can effectively reduce the maintenance cost and extend the life of the turbine and the platform itself as well. So lastly, let's just take a look at a, a digital twin model from that Three Gorges project that we saw earlier. And this was designed by Shanghai Investigation Design and Research Institute. This was China's first anti-ice flow offshore wind project. And using special monopile foundations and detailed 3D substation design model that you can see here, we were able to generate a simulation with simulation design tools are able to achieve an intelligent digital twin model. And here you see the, uh, the offshore substation with that uh, in that digital twin um, platform. So thank you very much. And I'm going to hand it back to uh, Elia. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Mark, for this very comprehensive overview of the digital twins. So please, if you have any questions uh, to Mark, feel free to submit them uh, using the chat function. Um, and now it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Callum Maxwell. Callum, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ilya. Can you see my screen OK? I think so, yes. Excellent. Um, Cool. Just making sure it's the right one for me as well. <laughs> okay. Um. Thanks very much for for inviting me along. Um. To discuss this today. Today, I'm going to talk about um electrical cable failure trending and reliability analysis, or as we call it, the electrode project within um within ORE Catapult. But before we get into that, um, a little bit of information about the offshore renewable energy catapult. If you're not aware of us, um. We are also a, a not-for-profit. Uh, we are the UK's leading uh, technology innovation and research centre for offshore renewable energy. We've got um, essentially two missions. The, the first mission here is um, to accelerate the creation and growth of UK companies, UK PLC, in the offshore renewable energy sector. But also um, the, the additional goal is to increase the uptake and the capacity of offshore renewable energy in, in UK waters um, and globally as well, of course. So how do we do that? Well, we've got um, a range of unique facilities, research and engineering capabilities. We love to work collaboratively with um, companies within the industry because we're part funded by the UK government. We essentially can, can collaborate on a number of, of projects for with um, the full range of the supply chain from tier ones all the way down to the SMEs and provide as much engineering support as as, as we have resource um, to, to support their ambitions, whether it's um, growth or um, 
within the UK sector, whether it is, is bringing a new product to market, whether it's trying to get a better understanding of how to enter the, the offshore market and, and can we support them in their commercialisation goals as well. Um, we are part of the Catapult Network, so the UK government set up a network of um, about nine catapults. Obviously, we're the offshore renewable energy focused ones, but there's also uh, the digital catapult, energy systems catapult. And the, the concept behind them was that the UK government wanted to create these research and technology organisations that, that could support um, the development of the economy and what they saw as, as high growth sectors. Um, and our, our goal is to, to support that, that larger ambition to, to support the transition towards a, a low carbon economy um so what I'd, I'd, i'm sure many of you have seen a chart similar to this um but just to, to give a context of the scale and the size of, of the offshore wind sector as we sit within it so um between now and and 2030 we're anticipating a, a huge push to try and meet some of the, the government uh, government targets, i.e. in the UK, but broader as well. So the UK government has has, has put in place um, an attempt to get 40 gigawatts of installed capacity by the year 2030. So you can see that kind of near term push represented on this this chart. And then beyond 2030, that, that um, installed growth rate probably reduces a, a, a little bit, but the overall capacity um, available capacity globally is going to increase substantially. So if we move on to the, the second chart, you can see that that cumulative annual growth rate is about 20% between now and, and 2030. And then that reduces um, down to about 6%. And what I think is quite interesting about this graph is the total Europe share is going to drop from 74% in 2020 down to 46% in 2050. So even though our capacity is increasing, our share of the market is going to reduce, which is which is great because what that means is other markets are starting to emerge over time, and um, and I think that's that's really positive view for for the the energy sector globally as as a whole. But Today, what I'm here to, to talk about a little bit is, is some of the challenges associated with, with subsea cable failures um, and specifically from the insurer's perspective as well. So many of you might have heard the statistics that um, subsea cables represent about 10% of the installed capex at the construction phase, and yet they represent about 75 to 80% of the total costs of insurance claims, even though they only represent about 40% of the total number of claims to made to insurers. So I realise that's that's a fair amount of numbers that I've, I've thrown at you there, but I think it it serves to demonstrate the the scale of the costs associated with cable failure and faults. Um, from our research, we've identified that 57 of the last 60 construction projects have experienced um, issues with cables that have resulted in a claim of some descript. Um, for inter-array cables, this has been between £125,000 per claim up to Ten million pounds, um, and for export cable, it's it's more significant. It's between seven seven million pounds and uh, up to twenty five million pounds. And then when you combine the claim with with the associated downtime, so for an interarray cable, the downtime can average at about thirty eight days, whereas for an export cable, it's it's uh, about sixty two days. All of this costs time. All of this costs money, and that uh, downtime has been reflected in in the the amount of of money that the insurance companies are having to pay out as part of claims. So, what do we want to do? Well, we believe at Orary Capital that if we've got better knowledge um, and can project better when faults are going to take place and and create some some level of predictive model and when those faults will become failures, and um, it will provide a much better oversight or, or provides empirical data to change your operational strategies going forward. But for the supply chain to evolve to produce these solutions, we need we need data to be shared more widely, which it is not at the moment. So we've engaged across the whole of the supply chain. We've spoken to designers, we've spoken to manufacturers, installers, technology developers, you name it, we've probably spoken to them. And the 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 they are crying out for um for a solution, a platform that can support this going forward. So electrodes um 
as we call it, is is our proactive approach to to pioneer how the industry can share anonymized data to support how cables can be designed or how faults can be better understood going forward. So it's a very simple simple vision. Um, to improve the reliability of subsea cables, we need to increase the level of insight. Um, so from our stakeholder engagement, we were able to identify that there is a clear requirement, there is a need for this to understand why cable failures are taking place, at what stage of, of development are they taking place, or at what stage during the operational phases are they taking place, and how can we start to, to, to counteract that, how can we improve design around it. So we've spoken to the industry, we've got the support of the industry, and now um, the next phase is, is bringing the data owners on board as well, um, so that we can start to, to carry out some of the, the, the trending. So where did where did we start from? So Electrode was was developed out of the cable reliability and failure and failure trending working group, which was uh, supported um, actively by the Carbon Trust. Um, what we tried to do was engage with a range of stakeholders that were that had a level of involvement, whether it would be in analytics, whether it's the cable design, whether it's the installation or construction and um, to try and get like a really broad view of how we could build a platform for the data owners that would support um would support the sharing of data um and the trending that we would need to incorporate at the back end of the system um to give us the the benchmarks that we're looking for so as you can see in the left hand side of this slide um we have the cable data putting um the cable data owners putting data into the system, which is the, the funnel that you can see here. Um, the red box indicates that once the data owners input that data, we will be anonymizing it with, with whoever it's shared with, um, unless they request their own data back, which of course they, they, they will get access to as part of the benchmark. So what we've tried to do is, is use that to identify what the root causes are, what are the failure modes, and how does it impact on generation and downtime and then created that kind of two-tiered subscription model underneath that. So with the, the cable, if you input data into the system, you're automatically eligible for, for a kind of tier one subscription, which gives you access, of course, to your data, but also to the operational trends. Um, we're not doing a kind of company A, V's company B style trending. It is benchmarked across an industry average so that you can see your own performance in comparison to the industry as a whole and then identify if there's areas of underperformance that that you could um that, that could be looked at to improve performance kind of thing for the tier two subscriptions that's open to absolutely everybody but they don't get the same level of access to the benchmarks what they'll get is the more general cause and failure overviews that we generate from the reports that we're pulling out across the wind wind um farm cables um I won't go through this slide in too much detail, but just to give an indication of, of what the failure mechanisms that we've been looking at so far are. We've looked at um, what happens in the length of the cable, the joints, the switch gears, um, um, and, and try to get an understanding of both the mechanisms and the failure modes um, to try and, and get down to the root cause, which will be really interesting once we get the root causes um, and can increase the confidence level in those root causes, we can start to work with the designers and the developers on how do we improve um, processes and this kind of thing. So um, basically we split it into three sectors. We're looking for repair metrics, we're looking for production metrics, and we're looking for event metrics. And what we will do is across all these metrics, this is just a summary, this isn't the full list, um, we will create um, quarterly reports, quarterly benchmarks, um, year-to-date performance and, and annual reporting figures as well that we can share with, the, with the, the data owners in a lot of detail and then with all the tier two subscribers in as much detail as, as, as we can essentially for all the general trends which should support the supply chain's development going forward as well. So we see benefits to the developers and the the operators and the asset management so for the developers to be having that additional insight into some of the the, the common cable system related um mechanisms should help us to inform what how we can improve processes going forward when we're in field to hopefully reduce the risk of of faults taking place at that very early stage um 
but what we're also hoping to get is with the empirical data provided, there'll be more of a justification to improve that to, or to increase that 10% of capex that, that's spent on, on subsea cables to a level where that we can do additional testing and, and improve monitoring practices for the cable after it's laid as well, which will benefit the operators in the operational phase going forward as well. But importantly, by having all these stakeholders on board, so early in this process should give us the opportunity to to collaborate effectively with them because there's a lot of future challenges that we need to start addressing including 66 kilovolt interarray cables and dynamic cabling specifically around float and offshore wind as well so from the operator perspective a better understanding again i won't go through all these bullet points because i know Ilya is going to share these um, slides with you after after this but getting a better understanding of all the the cable failure trends and where they're they're kind of where they're coming from will um will hopefully provide a better opportunity for own end planning um, and decision making which will maximize generation and ideally reduce the the downtime associated with faults moving into failures as well going forward and down at the bottom of the page there's been a huge push from the insurers as you can imagine having them foot in the bill for 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 many of the failures that take place by being involved in the program with this but also by by being as proactive as possible to mitigate faults turning into failures um, it gives confidence in the insurers as well and they'll be able to continue to provide insurance at the lowest uh, possible cost which for an operator's perspective should improve the the opex margins as well going forward and hopefully um, combined with less infield failures and less downtime associated with them so where are we at the moment with electrodes? Um, we're still at the sign up phase. So at the moment, we're looking to sign up interarray cable owners um, and, and data providers to pull them into the first phase of the electrode platform, which will then feed nicely into the platform launch, which we're aiming for the beginning of the next financial year, at which point we can we can kind of fully push forward with the the the, the data collection phase and the trend analysis that we're um, anticipating and start to put out some of the reports. So we're planning and putting out a minimum of, of, of two reports a year on top of the, the quarterly updates that we'll be able to provide to the, the tier one subscribers as well. Um, and in the future, what we're hoping to do with the program is to um, bring export cable um, into the platform as well obviously the the failures associated with the export cables can be significantly more expensive and um, we'd recognize that but at the moment we're um, trying to bring in the the inter array first but by creating this data and creating this database we're, we're optimistic that we'll be able to build a number of collaborative um, projects going forward that will improve uh, cable design where necessary and, and give the designers themselves a lot more data to play with to make sure that as they're um, designing the cables going forward that they're solving um, the problems that the industry's really faced. So um, thank you very much for, for listening to me um, this afternoon and happy to, to take any questions now and I'll, I'll pass back. Okay, um, perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Carol, for this very uh, insightful presentation. So we have approximately uh, 25 minutes uh, right now, and we can uh, have a small discussion around the technology updates. So, um, and I guess we can begin with a general question, and that's to both of you. Um, what are the current and most pressing technological challenges in the offshore wind industry? So maybe we can start with Mark and then Callum. Thank you. Very broad. Right. Yeah, most pressing pressing challenges I think is is um, we see is the, um, the 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 silos of data and coordination between um, uh, the many different stakeholders on the project. Um, so there, there's there's so many different parts to to an offshore wind farm. You know, and um, and getting all those those parts um, aligned, and everybody talking to each other very early in the project. Um, you know, we were just talking to um, to Shell and various other <coughs> major stakeholders recently, and um, you know, 
their 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 biggest uh, issue is is how can they pl better plan these projects, and um, you know in the conceptual phase, um, and certainly look at you know more effective costing options um, for offshore wind farms early in the project to avoid those kind of um, uh, cost overruns um, later on and project delays and um, and even you know uh, expensive opex uh, costs in operation as well. Okay, great, thank you, uh, Callum. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what Mark the the way you described as well that the data silos is is a real challenge. So if I if I kind of take the the, the challenges face in a slightly different direction and say one of if we're to hit the kind of UK government target um, of, of 40 gigawatts by 2030. One of the biggest challenges is, is the time associated with, with project development. So at the moment, the consenting phase can take anywhere between three years if you're extremely lucky, um, but it could be as much as seven years before you're, you're actually operational. It could be 10 years before you're actually operational. And a lot of that time is spent carrying out really important environmental impact assessments. But so much that that data should have already been collected by the oil and gas industry. So specifically, if I look at the, the North Sea as a region, a lot of the information should be available. However, the way it's stored at the moment is so segregated. If we can create um, a database, a system that pulls some of that as much of that data together as possible. And if you can put in specific requests to data owners for um, the, the the information that you need for, you know, just the, the general environmental data that needs collected, you might be able to take a lot of time off that initial um, consenting phase. And if you can achieve that, then I think that that would also support the investors because there's such a long lead time for an investor before you actually get any return on, on investment. The capex is just so substantial. So if you can reduce that lead time as far as possible, then I think we'll find a lot more investors within the market as well. Actually, just to add to Kellen's point, um, you know, we, we were talking with Lloyd's Register um, on the certification side back in back in March and April. In fact, you know, we did a joint webinar with them. And one of the things that they said is that um, they're finding, you know, as they, they're trying to certify these these offshore wind farms, is that, um, you know, th there's a lot of mistakes being made in understanding the design and getting the design um, and, and planning um, and and all the all the stakeholders early you know involved early in the project, and um, if they as a certified you know certification agency could be involved earlier, um, you know some of these offshore wind farms would run a lot smoother you know in terms of their project ex execution. Absolutely, and if if I can again jump on <laughs> on that as well, there's there so. My my experience of of some of the the developers and the manufacturers within the industry is is there's the, there's no feedback loop for them, so they will be prescribed. We need to build X amount of of monopiles, for example, to this specific design, but they don't get a huge amount of feedback on the performance of that asset once it's in the field. Um, and so if we can improve those feedback loops, then we can improve design and, and move away from what is traditionally oil and gas based design methodologies into something that, that might be slightly more bespoke to, to offshore wind as well. Perfect. This actually leads to the next question, which is which is we already uh, begun to cover. Uh, and that's <laughs> about what the offshore wind industry can learn from the offshore, uh, offshore oil and gas industry or any other similar uh, or related industries. Uh, so maybe Callum first this time and then Mark. Uh, absolutely. So I think I think we've actually already learned a lot from the, the design phase. A lot of the design regulations are based on on the oil and gas industry, and um, which I think is great. Um, the the safety record predominantly is really really strong, and we want to take that forward. Um, the the focus on on health safety and um, environment and quality from the oil and gas industry is transferred very very neatly across to the offshore wind industry what i think is is an interesting case study is the oil and gas is, is significantly more decentralized in the operation of assets 
Um, and that is, is quite an interesting look when it comes towards the decommissioning phase as well. So I've been in discussions with them. Um, with the, the nuclear decommissioning agency and the oil and gas decommissioning agencies. And we, the offshore wind industry, is at the very beginning of this curve. So our first generation of turbines are going to just start moving into this decommissioning phase over the next five and 10 years. And it's a, a huge unknown from a cost perspective. And um, so it, it will be we will lean heavily on the experience of of some of those decommissioning operators within the oil and gas industry on 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 best practice, best approaches, and and, and hopefully how how not to how to do it as effectively as possible without um, impacting the environment too much. Absolutely, yeah, you know, yeah, and um, you know we've we've worked in, as I say in the offshore business for the last forty years on on designing many of the the offshore oil and gas platforms, you know, the North Sea, Gulf of Mexico, China, et cetera. And, um, and um, you know, I think a lot of the oil and gas operators, they thought it was going to be an easy transition. And, and there, there is a, a, a certain level of, of ease, you know, understanding how to design those foundations. Um, and, uh, but then, you know, there's a lot of monopole design in the turbine you know and marrying that with the the larger and larger turbines um you know the the trying to make these more cost effective is a challenge and also taking into account that the turbine loads is is something you know that the oil and gas industry hasn't really you know appreciated um you know until now <laughs> and uh, when these turbines are getting larger and larger you know the, those loads are getting uh, much 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 bigger um, with these uh, very large turbines, so um, and then the, there is, you know, when you're designing these foundations, um, there's many more simulations. You know, we're talking 30, 40, 50,000 simulations to run on a um, on a single turbine foundation, and um, you know that that takes time and resources to, to manage those and, and understand the results from those as well. So uh, there's all sorts of those kind of challenges um, that, uh, you know, coming from the oil and gas industry uh, into offshore wind. Okay, perfect, thank you. And by the way, from the wind uh, size, uh, from, the, from the size of the turbine, um, do you know if it's possible to maybe calculate What's the biggest possible uh, effective one? Just out of curiosity, a uh, question. Or oh, there is no such a thing, no such calculation, and we cannot really establish what's the maximum possible size of a turbine, and uh, and then also of the rotor. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. I've absolutely no doubt that someone somewhere could could absolutely uh, calculate it. At the moment, we're sort of tending towards 20 megawatt. Is where a lot of our research is focused on. But whether that's where it tops out or not, I, I think I'd be I'd be very surprised if it was, <laughs> to be honest with you. But yeah, I mean, I guess I guess. Um, I'd probably defer across the mark for for his opinion, but I'm sure there's a calculation somewhere that say beyond this megawatt point, there's no point going any bigger. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't imagine. Yeah, once we get to 20 megawatts, uh, I can't imagine going, you know, any further. I think, you know, I think some of the major uh, turbine manufacturers, you know, Siemens and Vestas, you know, I think they're they're even struggling, you know, manufacturing the the size of the blades. Um, and, um, and and maintaining the integrity of the blades on those turbines at that size, um, and uh, that that's going to be the the biggest challenge <laughs> going forward is and and maintaining those those turbine blades uh, for sure. Um, and then you know, like I said, you know, all the that's an incredible amount of power and and uh, force that's going on to the the nacelle and the to, and the gearbox and then ultimately onto the to the foundation as well. So um, yeah, it's going to be incredible to see the the 20 megawatt uh, turbines yeah. come along. And we do. might, yeah, absolutely. And we might find that there's a different 
there's a different max for for floating platforms compared to fixed bottom because that amount of thrust that that, that could get generated by 20 megawatt turbine is going to be you're going to need some floating platform to try and support that i think it's probably safer if that's a jacket structure or a fixed bottom but i'm sure there's a designer out there that's got a solution no doubt about it yeah yeah you're right it, it is going to be very challenging when you get to the floating um you know we've been looking at you know some some just benchmark studies on on floating and um you know trying to keep the the tilt angle of those floating platforms um you know within plus or minus five degrees i think which is an acceptable standard at the moment um with these larger much larger turbines could be uh, pretty challenging in uh, certainly rough seas I, I guess the time will show and we see <laughs> what's going to happen in 10 20 or and, and more years and that's very nicely so we already began uh, the conversation about the floating and then the next question is specifically about floating uh, how would how could floating offshore wind development could benefit from technological advancements and especially in deep waters and there isn't some small extra question for mark um, one person um, asked how will your technology work with floating offshore wind so maybe uh, we can begin with Mark and then Cal. Okay, yeah. So um, so we 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 have a design. We have a product. We I mentioned Open Wind Power Floating, which we released end of 2020 for designing uh, floating platforms. Um, and you know we've been working with a number of the benchmarks um, and uh, Enrol and uh, a number of the organisations to. Uh, to benchmark um, the performance of these these floating platforms, um, and also a number of uh, EPCs. Um, you know, there's certainly a number of designs that have come from Japan, um, Europe. You know, the likes of Saipan and Principal Power and FloatGen and so on. Um, I guess the the big challenge, and I've heard this, is, is certainly going to be the industrialization. You know, in building out these um, uh, these floating platforms. Um, now, you know, the, the obviously with the, the floating platforms, they're going to be much, much further out to sea, you know, from the shore, you know, talking 20, 30 kilometers out um, and um, even further, you know, once we get to California, um, probably. <clears throat> and um, and that that's going to be obviously a challenge um, keeping uh, you know, monitoring and keeping, um, you know, the the inspection and, and maintenance on the, those floating turbines um, is going to be a challenging uh, exercise. And I think, um, you know, there's obviously been looking at, um, you know, how you can disconnect these floating turbines, tow them back to shore to maintain them and so on uh, is going to be the, uh, the next big challenge. Um, and um, and then tying all those um, tying all you know effectively tie you know there's still discussion going on about where do we where do we site the substation um, you know is it going to be a floating uh, floating substation is it going to be um, you know we'll, we'll build a, um, a substation close to shore and then um, run cables to that to that substation so uh, I think there's still a lot of discussion around. Um, you know how that's going to play out as well okay perfect yeah no i i guess uh on the, on the subject of since i've been discussing cables already this morning i think um dynamic cabling is going to be a huge technology challenge uh, there's a lot of organizations working on it at the moment but if if we look at the, the challenges associated with, with just feeding a subsea cable through a tube at the moment and then we add wave action we add tide action and um, then the, there's going to be a, a huge level of like suspension in a cable that's going to need um that is going to encounter a level of fatigue that we've not probably seen yet within cables so designing designing for conditions that we, we've not experienced yet is, is always going to be a challenge um, and it'll be interesting to see what the solutions look like in that space as well okay yeah. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I think I think there's going to we we're just touching on some of the technical challenges that um, are certainly going to be uh, much much uh, you know 
or more difficult and especially if if we uh, try with the larger turbines as well perfect okay great um so the next question is quite interesting um and we already touched a bit in the presentation especially in mark one uh which role artificial intelligence play or could play in the further development uh in the industry so uh maybe we start with mark he, he already covered a bit and then with callum yeah perfect okay so i touched i touched a little bit on um what we can do with artificial intelligence um today in fact um we can take a um a 3d reality model and, and this can be just generated from a, um, a drone flyover with uh, high definition uh, photo capture um, and then we can interpret that 3d reality model and um, you know using ai for um, detecting um, surface corrosion cracking um, um, maybe uh, certainly damage to the blades that kind of thing um, so that can be, you know, we're, we're seeing that now and we have, in fact, we have some technology within Bentley that does that. You know, we've already applied it to bridges um, and uh, a lot of uh, companies are taking advantage of that, that AI side. Um, there, there's obviously also the performance side. You know, I mentioned um, we're actually pro providing um, AI machine learning to, um, with uh, weather data to uh, predict the the uh, performance of um of turbines in a wind farm you know and and this is um <clears throat> you know even talking to some of the major um developers they want to know and i think um there's been um, a lack of wind recently in the last uh, few days in the uk that have stopped uh, in the north sea i saw an article uh, yesterday i think that uh, a lot of the turbines have stopped um spinning because of the lack of wind mm -hmm. and uh, if you could predict the uh you know with the weather forecast predict that um that that performance using ai um then um, that would obviously you know help to plan um you know power uh supply you know and, and repurpose you know um, uh, electricity from other parts of the grid um you know and, and spin up you know whether it's um, you know fossil, you know fossil or nuclear power plants to um, to offset that uh, that downtime on the on the uh, the wind farm. So yeah, there's, there's obviously a couple of areas there that uh, we're seeing. You know the application of AI. Yeah, I, I absolutely, completely agree with you, Mark. Um, from from my experience of working with with a number of like SMEs and, and kind of those innovators within the supply chain, there's there's a huge focus on on generating predictive maintenance solutions to some of the the key components. And there's a number of organisations that are out there doing it at the moment and creating risk based statistical matrices and and these kinds of things. And I think that is is such an important role at the moment. At the moment, one well, not at the moment there's a lot of data produced by offshore wind turbines more so perhaps than than any other industry and if we can utilize that data more effectively and how it's stored and, and pull it into a central resource that we can then start to deploy ai and, and ml techniques on on top of it then it'll be really interesting to see how that will change operational strategy and approach and specifically if we can change maintenance from from kind of scheduled routine maintenance towards truly predictive maintenance where possible i think that will reduce operational costs quite substantially um however it's a big risk to take it's a big risk for an operator with a very expensive asset to say we're going to entirely trust the data to tell us when something goes wrong um because there is there's there's definitely faith in humans to go out and, and identify 
every six months or, or every year whenever it's scheduled for it and just make sure that everything is is as it's intended to be kind of thing but there'll be a crossover period i suppose of where the the human might be used more to kind of reassert what the the data models are telling us and then if there's not a huge amount of deviation then at that stage we might see a slow transition towards a fully uh, data-driven approach um so yeah i think there's there's huge opportunities for enabling technologies in, in the offshore wind sector and we're probably again we're only scratching the surface of what what is the potential for this technology because as you know, as as humanity, we're only scratching the surface of what's capable of these for these technologies. So yeah, let's wait and see what happens in the next five, ten years, because everything could be completely disrupted and turn on its head, and we could be completely wrong, and that's okay. Exactly, and and once it's going to be possible to use artificial intelligence for weather prediction, I think that's going to be fantastic <laughs> for the industry for sure, but not only. Yes, that's. <laughs> That's incredible. Are you thinking Great. of your holidays, Ilya? Yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> just just one application, but there are so many of them. Um, Absolutely. Great. Um, so the next question is, again, to both of you, uh, how much progress has been made to enable making the cables and turbine blades from uh, recyclable materials? So uh, maybe, Callum, if you can uh, uh, mention your knowledge sure. on the topic and then Mark. Sure, absolutely. So, from a cables perspective, um, the so one one of the projects that we're running at the moment is a circular economy for the wind sector, and we are looking at, at blades, which is kind of the, the badly kept secret of what do we do with the blades? Well, we just sort of throw a lot of dirt on them, and um, so there's a huge focus on that and how we can use different technologies and and different the the different materials the challenge is as as mark touched upon is the length of a blade and maintaining that integrity is is very very difficult without using glass fiber um solutions supported by by wood fibers as, as well it's very difficult to 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 see at the moment a, a different technology that will easily come in and say yes this recyclable material can will, will definitely be able to to replace blades as we design them at the moment. However, what we can look at probably with with some success that we've had so far is look at the, the different technologies that we can use at the tail end. So without having to redesign the materials that the blade's made of, how can we recover as much from that material as possible? And there is there's chemical processes, there's there's pyrolysis that we can use that can recover a level of glass fiber. And we've been engaging with, with a number of companies where well is there is there a way that we can get back get the bundle of glass fibers back and can we then create some kind of grading system for how these can be reused within society so whether that's putting them into construction applications that could Im improve um rigidity or whether it's can you get it to an as raw material as possible and use it for something totally different um but we are as an industry we're at the early stages of of, of doing that and i think for for cables and subsea cables the challenge is 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 where do you get your your raw material for so most of them are like a, a rubberized material for for the outside and there, there's certainly ways that that we can recover um rubber from from other so it could be i mean it's a dramatic example but there's there's landfills full of tires all across the uk and we can certainly reuse some of that rubber back into the the cables but whether we get to 100 percent or not is is a big question but that is what we are driving towards within the Qs project is how can we get as close to fully sustainable as possible with, with some of these materials because across the wind turbine itself actually a lot of it through one process or another can be completely recycled it's just a challenge to get it to that and a challenge to make it economically viable to do that but if we can if we can put a process in place that kind of shows how that could be done then i think that is certainly the direction that the industry is going to move towards because it is the most economical thing for the the sustainability as a whole perfect uh, Mark, any last comments on this 
Yeah, but, no, I, I don't have a lot of experience in, in how they're going to recycle, um, you know, many of the parts um, on, in the industry. Um, I guess you know, one area might be, you know, obviously if you if you if the industry starts to go to suction buckets, you know, they, they those can e easily be uh, repurposed. You know, to different locations, um, where it's it's a lot e difficult, as uh, Callum was touching on decommissioning, <laughs> to to slice up and and um, you know a jacket or or a monopile, you know, and um, you know repurpose it somewhere else. But uh, yeah, uh, that's all I can think of. Okay, great. So thank you very much for all of your presentations, uh, your answers, this great discussion. Uh, so that's already brings us to the end of the webinar, and um, please join us uh, next month. The following webinar will be on October 13th, the same time from 1 to 2 Central European time, and the topic is Offshore Wind Development Challenges. So thank you very much, Callum and Mark, for your time today. Thank you, everyone, for attending the session, and have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you very much.